I'll speak a little bit from, from notes, and we'll show a lot of images, uh, so bear with me. Across different cultures, uh, not only in Asia, uh, but also globally, puppets have an unusual aptitude and affinity for the torments of hell. Not because puppets themselves are touched with brimstone, but because, as the British novelist and toy theater proponent G.K. Chesterton long ago pointed out, the small size of puppets and their limitations enable them to express large ideas and monumental events. As Chesterton put it, you can only represent very big ideas in very small spaces. Thus, we witnessed vivid representations of hell in Faust, which was performed as a folk puppet theater play in Central Europe before being adapted by Goethe. The classic uh, toy theater of Victorian England and a 21st century revival of this form of paper puppetry. And perhaps most gruesomely in the shadow puppet theater of uh, Qing Dynasty China. Today, I would like to explore depictions of hell uh, or naraka as it's known in the classical Wayang Kulit or shadow puppet theater of Java and Bali uh, in the country of Indonesia. In Wayang mythology, naraka or the netherworld is the bottom of a three-tiered world or three loka, all ruled by Bhattara Guru, the heavenly teacher, uh, who is roughly identical to Shiva to South Asians. And I'll be discussing the play uh, Bhima Swarga, Bhima in the Afterlife, which was already mentioned actually by, by Rachel uh, on our first day, um, which is part of the Wang repertoire of both Java and Bali, and, and features characters from the Mahabharata epic. The play takes the warrior Bhima from the middle world of humans, or the Majapata, to the depths of hell. Then. I will look at puppet uh, depictions of Yama, also known in Java as Yamadipati, the god who rules in the underworld, and his secretary, who in Bali is known as Suratma. Um, we've already heard about the importance of clerics in hell. Uh, scenic puppets uh, illustrating the punishments of Naraka, the souls of the damned, or Atma, and the minor horde of, of uh, spirits who carry out the punishments of hell. And I will conclude with a brief discussion of a Wayang play, uh, which was about the afterlife, which was performed by a devoutly Muslim puppeteer uh, based on this Hindu-Buddhist uh, mythology, which is at the core of Wayang as a practice. Uh, and my primary references today, uh, and for some years, have been this collection at Yale already mentioned, which is a collection of about 23,000 puppets. Uh, and related objects, uh, which in many ways is the, one of the most important resources for the study of Asian performing arts in the United States. And my understanding of puppets from this collection and from uh, many years of research uh, and practice in Indonesia is that puppets are a site of collective remembering uh, and patrimony, but are also at the same time tools for creating performances and conducting storytelling, which reflect the current moment and anticipate uh, possible futures as well. So Bhima Swarga, um, also known as Bhima Surga, or Bhima in the afterworld, narrates Bhima's shamanic passage uh, from the world of humans to the afterlife in order to rescue the soul of his father, Pandu, from the fires of hell. And it's often been compared uh, to the uh, Kunchu opera we just saw about Mulian. In Bali, uh, Bhima Swarga is a ritual drama, and it's performed at cremations to ease the passage of the deceased uh, into heaven. Balinese puppeteers who specialize in this play are initiated priests and are known by such priestly titles as Kimanku Dalang, or Juro Dalang, or Mpu Dalang. And like priests, they create uh, holy water and dress uh, in white robes uh, and wear their hair long. Um, a text from 16th century uh, Java identifies this play as one of the plays in a repertoire uh, uh, conducted by itinerant professional puppeteers. Uh, and another text, written perhaps uh, a, a few decades before the 16th century text, 
um, and found in collections in both Java and Bali, is a redaction of the complete dialogue of one of the key scenes of Bhima Swarga. And this might be, in fact, the very first piece of dramatic literature uh, from Indonesia, only very recently published. This scene uh, takes the form of what is referred to as a banta among uh, central Javanese Wayang practitioners. That is to say, it's a debate between two pundits about mystical knowledge, implying competition and hostility. And this debate pits uh, Bhima, the second born of the Pandawa brothers of the Mahabharata, against the high god Bhattara Guru in a back and forth rapid dialogue. The scene occurs actually towards the end of the narrative of Bhima Swarga. Bhima has already embarked on his quest to retrieve the soul of his father Pandu from the fires of divine Yama's hell, but so far has failed actually to extract Pandu from, these, from this afterlife. Bhattara Guru then enters uh, and is described in an open narration in the most idealized way. He's described as omnipotent and omniscient, never misspeaking, the torch that illuminates the world. And Guru quickly accuses Bhima of trying to kill Yama and usurp uh, Yama's power. But Bhima responds to this challenge uh, and uh, in a series of riddles uh, and, and uh, verbal contests, uh, uh, demonstrates at every turn that uh, he, Bhima, is more than the intellectual equal uh, to the high god. And after a, dispa a, dispa a spectacular display of knowledge in which Bhima reveals Guru's origin, Guru finally admits defeat. The high god puts his hands together and is about to make the sumba of obeisance, but is, prevent uh, but is prevented uh, by uh, Bhima. Stop, Bhattara Guru. A guru does not bow to a student. A god to bow to a human would be an inversion of the natural order. Bhima, because I am defeated, your father will take my place. In that case, a good end will have been reached. Pandu will take your place. But wait, how then is he to be reincarnated? No, guru, I will not permit it. You will continue to live on the summit as the guru of the middle world. No, Bhima, a god does not lie. Didn't I say earlier, if I am defeated, your father will take my place? And after some further arguing, Guru finally agrees to free Pandu from Yama's hell and honor him with divine names and status. He thus summons all the gods, including the hapless Yama, to carry out this plan. Where are you, Yama? Oh, I am here you, before you, Excellencies. This is me, Yama. Yama, Bhima has asked for your help. What do you wish, my lord? Maybe he asked for Yama's death. All oh, the gods will be so pleased by my death. No, that is not what is requested, Yama. Free Pandu from his bonds and deliver him to his place in heaven. And Yama agrees, and finally Guru orders Bhima to recite a mantra for his father, staving off evil, identifying the self as creator and destroyer, asserting omnipotence and non-existence, and bowing to Shiva. So Bhima Swarga, or this rendition of Bhima Swarga, shows humans as more than a match for the divine. While Bhima sometimes uses honorifics, he often refers to the high god as just guru. Uh, slide, a uh, relief on a pylon at Chandisuku, a mountain temple um, constructed in the middle of the 15th century, and so roughly contemporaneous with this play. Uh, shows Bhima and Guru standing at roughly the same height, both resting uh, on the heads of the same double-headed uh, snake. And the uh, Dutch archaeologist Stutterheim, in his study of the Bhima cult, argues that this posture depicts Bhima making a sumba. But looking at it more closely, the crooked elbow of Bhima's front arm and the straight elbow of the back and his straight-ahead gaze actually connote that he is speaking forthrightly to Guru, uh, not making obeisance, um, but doing something like the challenge uh, uh, which we saw depicted in Bhima Swarga. Uh, and this play uh, uh, is, uh, never renounces a belief uh, in the divine teacher, in Bhattara Guru, but also insistently asserts the superiority of Bhima as a personal savior who can rescue his father from hell. Um, 
And so BIMA offers deliverance from personal, and is a model for offering deliverance uh, 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 of an afflicted soul. Uh, and he gives uh, a, a deliverance from personal suffering, as well as the shackles that bind the souls of humans to the material sphere. The destiny of the deceased, uh, who shall go to and remain in hell, uh, from the perspective of this text, is not determined solely by the divine, the living, and this is something we've heard repeatedly uh, in this symposium, the living, or at least those with enough power to pierce the veil of the everyday sensory world, can intercede, uh, can negotiate, can reverse a decree. Now, the ability of Wang heroes to apprehend this uh, unmanifest dimension, uh, which is called Niskala in Bali, and thus embark on dangerous journeys to the afterworld, uh, is visualized in a puppet type, uh, which is on display in the exhibition, uh, and plays uh, a significant role in performances by puppeteers uh, from Bali, particularly central and north Bali. Uh, and this puppet is the, known as the Kayo Kapu, or Kapu Rangdu. Its Latin name is Sterculia uh, Foetida. It's a soft-wooded, umbrella-shaped tree known to grow up to 35 meters tall. And kapu trees are found in Balinese cemeteries. These are haunted sites where bodies decompose and sorcerers who quest for black magic have congress with malevolent spirits. To the untrained eye, a kayo kapu looks like any other deciduous tree. But the wayang depicts how this tree is seen uh, uh, for what is a person of discernment, seen by a person of discernment. Uh, someone in the know apprehends a riotous and grim spectacle of carrion pecking the entrails of a corpse, an abandoned uh, funeral bier, the naked uh, dead consumed by wild beasts, a witch who is cooking body parts in a cauldron, and a menagerie of other beasts and spirits. The kapu tree has been described as a tree of hell and is one of the punishments um, uh, meted on sinners uh, uh, to be bound to this tree in, uh, in the afterlife. Uh, and it could also function as a hell mouth or gateway to hell. Another such portal in the afterlife in the Javanese wine tradition particularly is the volcano Chandra di Mukha. Uh, this cauldron or kawa, uh, uh, this fiery mountain is both the site of punishment where the souls of the deceased are boiled until their impurities have been extinguished and also a generative source of power. The volcano's crater is the foundry where the corpse of the newly born Jamang Tutuka, for example, is infused with metals of sacred weapons in order to transform from a dead child into the metal-skilled uh, hero Gata Gacha, in order to defend the gods by defeating the evil Naga Prachona. So this uh, Chandrimuka is both a uh, hell mouth and a site of creation, and always a site of danger, uh, always simmering and threatening to erupt when the cosmic order is disturbed. The domain of hell uh, in Javanese Wayang uh, is ruled by the god Yama, uh, and as I mentioned in Java, is also known as Yamadipati. In Bali, uh, Yama looks and behaves much like any other ogre king. Um, but Yama, in Javanese renditions, uh, is a source of merriment. Uh, and we heard this earlier uh, about the kind of terrifying mixed up with the comical uh, as being something uh, found in many uh, Asian depictions of uh, hell beings. Um, Yama uh, has demonic aspects. He has fangs, wide open red eyes, body hair, a big tummy, large size. Uh, but particularly in puppets from the Surakarta or Solo uh, uh, region of Java, um, this uh, demonic aspect is coupled with ridiculous dress, uh, athletic socks, um, uh, or juba robes, the color of Christmas sweaters. And Yama attends gatherings of the gods, but his size means that he always stands on the periphery. Uh, he is regularly late to arrive and is prone to falling asleep during meetings. The, his supremacy in hell is symbolized by, in some Javanese renditions by a key or a set of keys uh, hanging from his belt. And in colonial Java, these keys uh, played a significant uh, symbolic or decorative role, uh, functioning as symbols uh, of belonging and providing holders with metaphorical access to other uh, worlds. 
In the Balinese uh, tradition, as already mentioned, Yama is accompanied by his secretary, Suratma, uh, who holds the rontal, or palm leaf manuscript, uh, containing the names and good and bad deeds of the deceased. Uh, this rontal is consulted uh, to decide upon the punishments for souls, uh, which Suratma um, inscribes in the rontal with a pangutik, a small knife he holds in his front hand. Uh, Rama is described uh, in the list of characters of an English translation of Bhima Swarga as an old rec record keeper uh, who may never have been young. And his fastidiousness in old-fashioned ways, Rontal haven't been used for record keeping in Bali uh, for many years now, make him a ready source of a uh, target of humor. Um, one of the most interesting uh, Suratma puppets in Yale's collection comes from a set of puppets formerly owned by Ida Putu Manku Dalang, uh, who hails from the North Balinese village of Tango Wisya. Um, and a set of, of, of uh, Ida Putu's manuscripts uh, acquired in 1973 by a Balinese archive also indicate that he was a practitioner of black magic. Um, and so it's probably not incidental uh, Sorry, uh, it's probably not incidental that in this Putu, uh, Ida Putu's uh, Suratma, we actually see his own name uh, inscribed in the, uh, in the cover of the manuscript. Uh, he knows that one day he'll be judged for his own deeds. So now I turn to the punishments of hell. Uh, Wayang, unlike uh, much Chinese shadow puppetry, is light on scenery. And the same all-purpose prop and set device, such as the Kion or the Tree of Life puppet, tend to be reused for diverse effects. And so uh, it's significant uh, that uh, Bhima Swarga uh, has, many, uh, has a number of key props which are associated with it, which are, are used, tend to be used only in this one play, particularly as performed in Bali. Uh, North Bali. Uh, the first of these is a, is a cauldron or a kawa or jambangan where the souls of Bhima's parents uh, Pandu and Madrim are boiled along with the souls of others as well. Uh, and they're boiled because of Pandu's uh, unwitting sin of uh, killing a Brahmin uh, when the holy man is disguised as a deer. Um, and this is normally, this kawa or cauldron uh, is depicted as a copper hell pan decorated with the heads of two cows. It's said to sit atop a crackling fire that burns day and night. Uh, the punishment of dipping, being dipped in such a hell pan uh, is recorded as early as, eight, uh, as an inscription of 880 uh, and is also depicted in a stone relief in uh, Chandijago. Um, um, a second uh, set piece uh, used to dramatize a punishment of hell is the Kayu Churiga, or dagger tree. The slightest movement uh, from a demon bird sitting on its branches causes its daggers to fall down, slashing the sinners who are bound to the tree's trunk. Uh, and this is said to be a particularly apt punishment for poisoners, those who use black magic against others or adulterers. Uh, one denizen of hell in the uh, aforementioned translation of Bhima Swarga uh, describes uh, undergoing this punishment as being stung and pierced in more places than you ever thought you had. Uh, a, more, a much less common, maybe a unique punishment depicted in this puppet from the Tabanan region of South Bali shows a person suspended over a burning fire by a rope attached either to their genitals or anus. It's not clear here. And a rat we see is, up, uh, is, is on its way up the pole, uh, presumably to gnaw at the rope. And we heard before uh, how these kind of premonitions of, of punishment are often most terrifying. I'd like to turn now to the atma, or souls of the dead in hell, uh, who are encountered in some sets of puppy, puppets, uh, particularly from these priest puppeteers I mentioned earlier who perform Bhima Swarga uh, at cremation events. Uh, and the Angs, set, uh, at Yale, uh, Angs collection at Yale, the most extensive set uh, come from this sorcerer's puppeteer uh, collection, Ida Putu Manku Dalang. And Angs pup, uh, Balinese informants provide lively explanations uh, about each of the puppets uh, and the sins that result in, their, uh, uh, in, in these punishments as examples of hukum karma or uh, uh, the law of karma. 
Uh, and we see something in the spirit of, uh, uh, of Bosch here in the, in, the, in the comedy of these uh, punishments. So here we see a puppet of an old man burdened uh, for eternity by the weight of uh, naked children. He's being punished for, being, for sponging off his grandchildren. Uh, a builder here is being punished for failing to give offerings or consult the ritual calendar, uh, and his punishment is carting a piece of heavy plywood for eternity. Uh, a stingy man is forced uh, to bear tiffins of food and containers of drink uh, uh, in close contact, uh, contact with him, but never to be enjoyed uh, uh, himself. Uh, a dishonest puppeteer is pictured here who has to carry around a box of puppets and two gundair instruments while being bitten by a dog. A prostitute is shown as being penetrated uh, by giant phalluses and uh, a gigolo or male prostitute is persecuted by flaming vaginas, again while being bitten by a dog. Okay, I'd like now to turn to uh, demons or imps known as Satan in Java, who are said to uh, be the beings at the bottom level of hell, of Dasareng uh, Nagara, and are responsible for carrying out uh, the punishments of hell. Um, these puppets uh, have other functions as well. Uh, for example, they can be used as weapons when subject, uh, summoned by a magical spell or be part of an entourage of an ogre king or forest spirit or tempt a meditating knight. And they resemble something like the uh, preta we heard earlier from uh, Dawud Ali's talk, uh, coming in various uh, shapes and sizes. Uh, some of these are found in many sets. Uh, Others uh, might be unique uh, creations of a particular puppeteer. Uh, and a large number of them carry around uh, or even munch on uh, human body parts. Um, a frightening vision uh, that shows the punishments of hell and progress. Um, but they also speak in nonsense syllables or childlike rhymes. Lelepa, lelepa, panaku iwapmenta, tipanga nyingburi uma. Some are simply carved uh, and colored like the, uh, like the Atma shown earlier and may lack moving parts. Uh, but many of them uh, have unusual degrees or sites of articulation or trick mechanisms. And in the hands of a skilled puppeteer, a well-designed well -design, uh, uh, puppet can be this very comical. So you can see going back and forth. <laughs> I'll just show, uh, I hope this works here. You can see the degrees of motion of these comical uh, Satan, as they're called, little demons. Here's another one. And mechanisms there. Okay, and third. So, uh, concluding here, uh, hell in Javanese Balinese, and Balinese Wang is not a final destination. This is something we've talked about already. It's wrapped up in the stuff of everyday life. Uh, characters sojourn there, sometimes temporarily. Its nominal ruler is Yama, um, but he, who has to be present for the role uh, call of the gods, just like all the other Dewa and Sangyang. Hellmouths are uh, also natural features of the uh, middle world's landscape. Uh, trees or volcanoes, uh, and the souls of the dam uh, remain insistently fixed uh, to the people and things uh, that identified them in life. The Satan are ghastly, but also earthly. They're comical, even childish. And Naraka might be intimidating. Its horrors are never completely diffused. But Wang grants uh, a, an abstract concept of an afterworld a certain kind of affordance. It can be grasped. It can be played with. It can be made into our own image. Um, so it comes as uh, not much of a surprise uh, than when the devoutly Muslim uh, Javanese puppeteer Mansur, later Haji Mansur, created a play called Duryodhana Takon Swarga, or Duryodhana Asks About the Afterlife, um, uh, in uh, the 70s or early 80s. Um, there are very distinctly uh, Islamic accents. Oops, I'll go back here. Sorry, that's the, that's the cassette cover. Um, uh, in this play, 
Duri Dana here on the left, uh, shows up unexpectedly in the heaven of Suralaya to demand that Pratata Guru reveal to him uh, the Alam Kalanganan, or the world of the hereafter. Under duress, Guru's vizier, Bhattara Narada, uh, shown here on the, on the right, um, reveals uh, to him uh, the Alam Kalanganan, uh, this afterlife, uh, and takes him inside uh, Man Mount Chandradimuka, this volcano where the afterlife is sometimes located. Uh, to, to undertake the journey, Duridara is said to have to die first. Not literally, explains Narada, but figuratively by extinguishing his senses. He must also promise uh, not to say a word in the journey, saving all his questions for later. So they descend together, the king and the god, into the volcano and turn right first to enter the heavenly space, Nirvana or Swarga Loka, as it's described, which is said to be a creation of Bhattara Guru, the heavenly teacher. No details are given other than Duridana feeling cool and comfortable and enjoying a pleasant spell. Returning to the entrance, uh, they then turn left to experience a burning heat and foul odor, trembling, uh, and, break, and, and Duridan trembles and breaks out in a cold sweat. He also glimpses a diamond-studded golden boat without a pilot. Emerging from hell, Narada explains to Duridana that his cousins, the noble Pandawa, are destined to live in the hereafter uh, in this uh, world of the right channel, the world of Nirvana, while Duridana and his entire clan are destined to inhabit the left channel. The pilotless boat, Narada reports, is a symbol of the kingdom he rules. For Duridana pays too much uh, heed to the evil advice of his minister, Drona, so that the ship of state, in effect, is without a, a pilot. Duridana then promises to repent. He drives Drona from the kingdom. He gives charity, and he turns his kingdom over to the Pandawa, who he says are Astina's rightful heirs. Of course, in this branch story, complications arise, and at the end, the play uh, returns to the status quo. Specifying the different religious traditions, the Hindu Buddhist, the Islamic, the syncretic mystical, which define this dramatic uh, representation of hell is, uh, is beyond the, uh, the scope of this paper, but something we might uh, open up to discussion later. The point, though, is not to ascertain what hell is, but rather what it does. Hell is a construct that reminds the living to adhere to the norms and values of religion. As Narada tells Duridana, um, if the plays start, a place in the afterlife depends on actions committed while in the world of the living. The guideposts are clearly demarcated by organized religion. Uh, failing to adhere to these prohibitions has consequences uh, to be glimpsed in a mediated uh, fashion uh, in performance. Thank you very much. Okay. Hell, as we have been discussing, is a human universal giving meaning to death, grief, and mourning is the work of culture as abundantly testified by at least three exhibits running simultaneously in New York City at this moment. Um, it's the work of culture that addresses the needs of both the dead and the living, as much of the material in Comparative Hell suggests. As much of the, um, the departure of the dead, as we've seen um, in the exhibit in some of the presentations today, death is often addressed as a journey. The dead go away. They go somewhere else. And what they experience there, um, that comes to us as imaginings of paradise and hell, but also as conditions that concern us uh, not only as moral lessons, but as an equally moral sense that what the living do on behalf of the dead is consequential. This was um, touched on in the keynote address. It was mentioned in a couple of the presentations. You'll hear a lot more about it now. Uh, the part departure of the dead from the everyday world of social attachments may, as in Korea, be regarded as both necessary and dangerous, consequential for both the dead and the living. In Korea, as in China, Korea, as in China, Japan, Vietnam, many places, 
death rituals, and subsequent mortuary rites are intended to transform the dead into ancestors, to mark in a gradual way their departure from the living family to whom they return as shadow presences. In some sense, always there, but ideally quietly there, and only slightly more present when they receive veneration on ritually marked occasions. But there are also circumstances where the dead are too much of an active presence among the living, a dangerous situation requiring the work of shamans to neutralize their influence and render it benign. Um, in Korea, in the world of Korean shamans, hell is a place of troubled and potentially troubling dead. Now, just as a touchstone for where we've been already, uh, you'll see this near the entrance of the exhibit, an 18th century um, hell painting from either Korea or possibly China. The paintings are very hard to distinguish. The theme is similar. Um, a king of hell who is portrayed very bureaucratically, um, a, uh, and uh, much like a magistrate in the popular imagination, you see how absolutely bureaucratic the setup is. His desk is full of paper, petitions come pouring in, and you see the deceased there on the right, you know, like a traditional criminal in a Kang, being led by the Yaman runners, brought to justice. Um, and like the traditional magistrate's court, it is not unamenable to small acts of bribery and corruption. That might be the meaning of you see the attendant with the plate piled with fruit and the um, uh, gentleman dressed like a scholar official um, in tow. Now, um, most images you will see, well, that, that was the last art. We jump from the world of produced image, we jump from the world of text into a world of um, manifested performance. And most of the images you will see in my presentation are from field work I did in the 1970s, a few from the 1980s. The village settings in my slides, the significant environmental theater that is background to what I'll be talking about, has largely disappeared, although these rituals have not. They have been adapted to urban architecture and commercial shaman shrines, such that while they have lost a literal spatial trajectory from the house out to the fields, out beyond the family space, the, um, the rituals themselves still acknowledge a trajectory that sends the dead out away from the house, away from the family, away from the social world of living kin. Shaman rituals for the dead follow upon the spatial logic of Korean funerals and ancestor veneration. And these bear the strong influence of Confucian family rites set down in ritual manuals, but inflected with local practices. The most visual and publicly signifying event of the traditional Korean funeral was the journey of the corpse to the mountain grave. Custom enacts this journey as a difficult passage marked by a doleful chant about the hard life of the deceased. Living descendants would demonstrate their unwillingness to let go of the dead. A son might plant himself in front of the path of the bier and say, no, 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 I don't want him to go away to the mountain. And then others, bluntly affirm the necessity of passage. Oh, you've got to let him go. He's beginning to smell. Those who traditionally carried the beer, non-kin, and in some communities, former slaves or tenants, would stop in their tracks and refuse to continue unless fortified with liquor and cash. Thus, 
forcing the mourners to enable the painful process of separation, something living kin will also be called upon to do in shaman rituals for the dead. Now here we have multiple trajectories. The, the corpse, the physical corpse has gone to the grave where the bones become vectors of geomancy called pungsu in Korea, known here popularly as feng shui. They're in the ground transmitting energies of an auspicious grave site to the living. The dead are present in the grave, but the soul also navigates the Buddhist underworld for 40 days and simultaneously the soul returns to the family as an ancestor. A presence associated with a wooden tablet or a photograph kept on a temporary altar on the house veranda and fed daily with offerings through the mourning period. At the end of the mourning period, with the final ritual offerings and amid wailing, the altar is taken down and the mourner's clothing burned. The deceased is now a fully realized ancestor, a benevolent presence who returns to the family for periodic rites of veneration on each death anniversary, comes home for New Year, is there at the Mid-Autumn Festival. Ideally, the rites are performed by living male descendants within four generations. Now this assumes a smooth transition for those who have died, fulfilled, made their peace with the living, and have male descendants to perform the chesa. But this does not always happen. Some dead are restless, hungry, filled with unrequited desire, um, like the young woman you saw in the Chinese opera, um, unrequited, or they're just plain resentful. A man who worked hard and died in his prime regrets his absence from the world of the living. A dead wife resents the comfortable life enjoyed by a living second wife. A sister-in-law replays her old jealousy toward her brother's wife. And some family dead never attained the proper status of ancestors anywhere at all. They died young, they died unmarried, they died without descendants, and some died violently far from home. Sometimes the dead come bearing benevolent desires to see and touch the living, but when they move among the living, their presence is necessarily unwholesome. A dead mother is drawn to commiserate with her married daughter over the death of a child. A mother is concerned for a son who drinks excessively. A grandmother tenderly reaches out to stroke a new grandchild. Actions all with benevolent intentions that nonetheless can precipitate illness, madness, or social disruption. Um, there's a proverb in Korean, Chugun sonun kashi sonida, when the dead move among the living, no good results. Not for the living, not for the dead. The hand of the dead is a hand, a hand of thorns. It cannot touch living flesh without inflicting injury. And this is when a family might call a shaman to ease the passage of persistent dead away from the house and the daily lives of the living kin, to do this in a way that confers benefit on both the living and the dead. Now, the shamans and their work. The shamans I will be speaking of are broadly called mudang, religious practitioners who are empowered to engage the dead, oh, sorry, to engage ancestors, ghosts, gods, through feasting, song, and dance, winning the benevolent regard of the gods, mustering their power so that things unclean and inauspicious can be cast away and the client's fate opened to good fortune. Mudang are, in the classic sense, masters of the spirits, or at very least, agentive in their ability to persuade the spirits to a positive end. Among Mudang, the Manchin, who are at the center of my work, were traditionally located in the vicinity of Seoul and North Korea, but so, um, with some regional variations in ritual form. Because the, the Munchen's vivid visual style has been popularized in the media, it is now mimicked throughout the peninsula, 
And the mobile, in the mobile society that is contemporary South Korea, shamans from other regions now apprentice with Munchen. The first hand accounts I will be giving you are from the Seoul, Gyeonggi province tradition of Munchen. These are charismatic. They enter the prof uh, profession through an involuntary calling marked by visions, fits of madness, and other uncanny behavior. The, at her initiation, the Munchen evidences a capacity to speak and act like a god, to burst out with words that convincingly articulate the true intentions of the spirits. Successfully initiated, a Munchen is able to define and perform simple rituals for clients. But she also embarks upon an arduous apprenticeship with a senior shaman, where she learns to manifest and entertain the gods through elaborate costumed rituals called kut. One holds a kut, I was told, when the ancestors are hungry and the gods want to play. Gods maintain the harmony and prosperity of the household, but when they get angry at neglect or other infraction, they drop their guard and enable the dead to move among the living as an unwholesome presence. A divination session precedes a client's decision to sponsor a kut for her household, an expense the client undertakes only if the munchen's diagnosis is resonant and compelling. Through the divination, the Munchen parses her client's situation with the aid of inspiration from her gods and the client's answers to her increasingly specific questions about the family's circumstances and their ancestral history. On this basis, the Munchen diagnoses which god or ancestor, or more likely which configuration of gods and ancestors, has urgent business with the living. She shares this background information with the other members of the Munchen team that she assembles to perform the kut, and in this way, they begin their work with the kernel of a family story developed and elaborated upon during the actions unfolding in the kut itself. In kut, significant spirits, each with a characteristic persona, become visible and active in the ritual space through the costumed shaman's ability to conjure them into presence with her use of song, gestures, dance, facial affect, and verbal repartee, and by deploying a variety of props. This is not a one-on-one -on -one possession in the manner of a spirit medium, but neither is it just theater. The Munchen operates through a mingling of inspiration uh, bestowed by her own personal gods, sounds, visions, bodily sensation, intuition, and performance skills. The segments of a munchen's kut pearl out like beads on a ritual chain performed by alternating munchen who layer and then unlayer themselves, revealing the colorful robes associated with each of the gods they manifest in sequence, making the gods and ancestors an active, sometimes playful, sometimes angry, sometimes tearful presence, always interactive with the clients. Gods whose presence is enabled by costume shamans make imperious demands and eventually agree to help the family. But then when the ancestors show up, uh, this addresses the emotional presence of the dead through a mutual venting of grief between ancestors and their human interlocutors, an exchange that is often touched with recrimination but also compassion, where commiserating ancestors manifested by the munchen rub the shoulders and the back of a grieving descendant and splash uh, them with real tears. Cups of wine pass between tearful ancestors in the, in car manifested by weeping shamans and tearful descendants. They're drinking together even where the ancestor acknowledges that heavy drinking and fast living precipitated his early demise. These are the most personal and heart-rending exchanges in the kut, and both the living and the dead are expected to cry their fill. 
The dead are drawn by, uh, to the living by longing, grief over their shortened lives, and resentment over desires unfulfilled. Strictly speaking, some of the most vibrant manifestations are not proper ancestors at all, because they died without descendants to feed and care for them. The range of familial dead acknowledged in the ancestor segment of Akut is necessarily more inclusive than the family ancestors of Confucian precept. In the wake of the ancestors proper, others make their presence known. An unmarried wife or daughter-in-law's own parents and dead siblings are not ancestors in her husband's house, but they often appear following upon a mountain sighting of their problematic presence as souls that have salient concerns and grievances to vent. The ancestor sequence thus bridges contradictions in the official Confucian template of family membership, which renders a married daughter an outsider to her husband's kin, whose bonds to her natal family were structurally but by no means emotionally severed when she married. Those who died as children, maidens or bachelors, are no one's ancestors without descendants to feed them. They are consigned to the realm of wandering ghosts, about which you've already heard a great deal, who hover in nameless and malevolent crowds and are pacified with food scraps outside the house gate thresholds again. Uh, but in shaman practice, memory and sentiment draw these awkward dead as children or siblings back into family space such that they arrive at a kut in the wake of their elders. Indeed, the resentments and desires of these socially unsettled beings are a common source of domestic trouble. And much ritual work is directed toward calming them with soothing words and gifts of food, clothing, candy for the dead, for dead children, travel money to speed them on their way. In the two images, photographs taken within perhaps 10 minutes of each other, you see on the left the Munchen manifesting a husband's sister who died as a maiden. Sexually unfulfilled, mischievous, flighty, the kind of ghostly presence that might unsettle the relationship between husband and wife. But in Kut, her naughtiness and teasing is sometimes an occasion for humor. The client has an amused expression on her face. In the image on the right, um, the client is meeting her dead brother, manifest by the same munchen. This was a more loving relationship and the siblings share tears. Um, where a death in the family is recent, or where the dead have given evidence of an active troubling present, presence, the family sponsors a kut for the dead, a, a chinogi kut in this part of Korea, it's called. Um, some of you saw the Chindo, uh, the Chin Island version here at the Asia Society a few years ago, the, uh, where it's called a Shikim Kut. But what I am going to be talking about is locally called a Chinogi Kut. Um, this is uh, held to take the, uh, send the dead out of hell and into paradise, where they will lead nice, calm, quiet existence. Um, and not to, coincidentally to send them in a direction decisively away from the house and the living family, the directional dynamics of a funeral procession. The send-off occurs at the end of a kut. The gods have been played and been placated inside the house in the inner courtyard, and the ancestor sequence has also taken place inside. But now the action moves out of the house, out of the courtyard, out the main house gate. The sanja, the death messenger, this is like the old yamen runner. He's going to haul the dead away to the court of hell for judgment, just as yamen runners would snatch away the criminals. Um, and the kut replicates this horrible confrontation where Munchen usually put the god's costumes on right beside the drummer in full view of the participants. When it's the Saja, the, the Munchen goes outside, sneaks around the side of the house, costumes up, and comes, puts on the rough hemp of a mourner's uh, robe, and tradition, uh, uh, then 
comes with the mourner's staff, comes barging in the gateway of the house, growling, banging the gate, trying to enter the house. And of course, you don't want any death messenger to come back inside your house. The women cluster together to protect the family from any further abduction by the death messenger. Now, in this photograph from 1977, the women crowding around the door, they had actually been gossiping, and they'd missed the death messenger's arrival, and she bangs on the gate to get their attention, and then, oh, yes, 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 we have to protect the house, and they all assemble. Uh, True to type, the death messenger threatens to beat the ancestor. The ancestor is this little dried fish that's bound with mourner's hemp with the shroud material, and she threatens with her bell, I'm going to beat them. You know, just as would happen, you know, in, this is the kind of thing that happens when you're hauled away to hell. And the women here, it's not good works. The bribes are literal. It's cash that gets rolled up and goes into the mouth of the fish to stop the dead from being beaten. And um, as in Korean mortuary rites, a tray has been prepared with offerings for the death messenger, and the shaman portrays this as just a ravenous, frighteningly ravenous presence who stuffs her mouth and smears her face with food. Uh, now this photograph, um, the, uh, on the right here, the death messenger has snatched an apple from the ancestor's tray. You know, and the women are saying, no, your food is over here. We've given you a lot. And she says, tough, you know, I took it and it's mine. And that kind of play would go on. Now, uh, well, finally, the death messenger's paid off. He goes away. And a manchin performs the ballad tale of Princess Padi, Padi Kongju, the seventh daughter of a sonless king and queen, a girl baby who was cast away in disappointment and raised in obscurity. This is a hero's journey, that kind of tale, with a female hero so recognized by the shaman who told me the story. When the king was struck with a deadly illness, he was advised to find an herb growing in the underworld that would heal him. His married daughters were all busy with their domestic obligations and unable to undertake this dangerous journey. But Princess Body, the one he had cast out, took the challenge, disguised herself as a, as a man, and braved all manner of dangers that are recounted. The landscape of the underworld is recounted in the ballad. After various adventures, she accomplishes her, re her mission and returns with the herb and also, um, almost coincidentally, with a husband and seven sons. In gratitude, her father offers her the kingdom but Padi has been moved by the suffering of souls in the underworld and is resolved to live there where she can minister to their needs. Some call her the ancestral Korean shaman. One can see in this story some resonance with stories of other East Asian goddess figures who, in the legends told about them, undertake salvation work as unmarried daughters. Ma Tzu on the China coast, um, Guanyin of the South Sea, uh, the mother goddess Liu Hang in Vietnam. Um, in the context of the Chinogikut, the story is an oblique acknowledgement that while sons are essential for ancestor rights, it is women as shamans and clients who are addressing the needs of the unsettled dead. The ballad done, the shaman opens her fan, holds it over her head, and becomes the road guide and walks ceremoniously around the offering tray. She's leading the dead through the underworld, the underworld that has been mapped by the ballad of Princess Padi. They safely navigate hell. And after this, to mark a graphic journey, Roads of cloth are stretched out, and the shaman tears her way through, through first a, a piece of rough hemp to signify the road out of hell, and then a finer weave for the road into the Buddha's lotus paradise. On occasions where the death is recent, the cloth may be stretched out long to indicate the difficulty of separation. Now, while the manchin 
take it carries the dead down the road. She might. And think, remember, remember the, the beer carriers and the stopping and the cajoling and the pushing. She stops and she says, I want to go back and see Oogie. I haven't said goodbye to Oogie. And they say, go on, go on. You're going to a good place. Oogie's already gone home. I don't want to go. Go. It's, it's nice. You'll like it there. And so the living are brought to having, as much as they want the dead to be with them, the living kin and the neighbors are caught up in the act of urging the dead to move on, that this is what the living need and this is also what the dead need. This is good for the dead. They're leaving hell. They're going to paradise. They're going to a good place. And then the dead return one final time, transformed and reconciled, a manifestation at the ancestral offering tray, no longer grieving, but expressing gratitude to their kin. So, in conclusion, through this ritual process, living and dead come to terms with the necessity of separation. In distancing the dead, the living have helped the dead out of hell and onward to paradise. Is it ritual theater? Is it psychodrama? Does it matter? The Quit for the Dead has a powerful and graphic dynamic, so powerful that from the 1980s at least, it has become an idiom of political theater, initially performed to commemorate martyrs to democracy. A memorable Chinogikut was held at the funeral of Ihan Yol, a, su a student protester who had been struck in the head with a tear gas canister in the demonstrations that precipitated the collapse of the Chandukhuan regime in 1987. The shaman in the memorable press photograph was actually a professor of Korean dance who had studied the ritual from shamans. But shamans have been called upon to perform similar rituals to similar ends, and Chinogi could continue to articulate political sentiments. They have been performed to succor the military comfort women conscripted by the Japanese Empire and the school children who drowned on the Sewol Ferry in 2014. I don't know that it's happened yet, but I anticipate that there will be a Chinogikut to commemorate the young Koreans and foreigners who died in the crowd crush in Seoul's Itaewon district last Halloween. These are events that grab at human emotions and memories, and the shamans have powerful work to do. The dead are, you know, as long as there's hell, there's got to be shamans. Thank you. I'm, my head is just swimming. Uh, I'm so stimulated by all the connections. I have a lot of extra notes about uh, make this connection and make that connection. I know that's not going to happen, so I'm going to go ahead uh, uh, and launch into it. Um, I'm really talking uh, today primarily about the role of performance in making the afterworld real. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of what we've been talking about. And, and from, the, from, the, from the very beginning, uh, the, the, the first uh, the keynote presentation, there's this question of, of skepticism and the reality or unreality uh, of the next world. And one way that the next world becomes real, and I think most importantly for the purposes of my talk, becomes sort of convincing and standardized is through the role of performance, uh, in this case combining uh, texts together with image, uh, together with vocal art, uh, and so on. So without further ado, um, I want to talk about uh, the role of itinerant preachers in the uh, establishment of two places in the Japanese landscape of hell that were unknown uh, in the Chinese hell landscape, along, that, are, that are put there along with uh, images and figures that come from India, that are developed in China, and so on. These are new Japanese innovations. Um, they're called uh, the Saino Kawada on one hand, and we see that over here on uh, 
the left hand side we see the Bodhisattva Jizo. Um, he's the very first in the very first image of the cho, uh, of the show of of Jijang and uh, the Ten Kings. Uh, he is he is Jijang. He is Jizo. He is Dizang. He's Kshiti Garba. We've heard about him a lot. Uh, he is really the main savior from hell in the East Asian pantheon. In, in this world here. Uh, he is presiding over a children's limbo, children who've died before the age of seven, thus leaving their parents without ancestral care uh, that they should have provided, are doomed to build small stupas uh, that in many versions are then knocked down at the end of the day by, by a demon. Um, some of them are not, some of them cr are crying with frustration and, and fear and so on. Others are, are having a nice time. Here we see one uh, riding a hobby horse with a, with a, a horse's head and a, and a stick and we, we have others of them playing. Um, behind them here, sorry. Uh, are the uh, five chakra stupas, or the sort of stupas that they would that they're attempting to build here that would exist in the real life? This is what they should have lived to go on and construct. The other figure I'd like to talk about is Datsueba, and uh, she is the uh, the hag of hell. And this word hag, I, I hesitated to use it, and I, tr I tried to find other solutions for to find a less misogynistic kind of term. And what I told myself was, these images of, of uh, Datsueba and of the uh, world that she inhabits, the hell she inhabits, are by nature misogynistic, and, incre and increasingly misogynistic through the early modern period. Um, so I'd like to, to leave her as he, she is. Um, she takes the clothes of the dead. Uh, and then she hangs them up here uh, in trees. We usually see her with one leg uh, lifted vertically like this, uh, holding a piece of cloth, uh, and often she's a very demonic and frightening figure. So I'd like to talk about the establishment of these two figures. The way that these figures become uh, established in the Japanese uh, landscape of hell is through the medium of performance. And the, performance, the performers in, these case, in this case are nuns, uh, the most famous of these, although there are others from Issei and Zenkoji and other places, the most famous of these being uh, nuns from uh, Kumano, called the Kumano Bikuni. You can see uh, she's holding a, a stick to, to, to lecture on this image. She has one leg up, which is a very typical kind of preaching uh, posture for these women. And she's preaching uh, to these people and talking about um, hell. These women, uh, over the course of the, seven, of, of the 17th century, 18th century, uh, 19th century, disseminated uh, knowledge about uh, belief in uh, the details of hell uh, throughout the whole country. So one thing that we heard about uh, from Rachel was the, the sort of constrained and limited nature of access to images and the ways that a lot of the images, uh, scrolls, uh, hell, hell scrolls, hell screens uh, would have only been seen by a few people. These large format preaching mandalas were seen by many, many people. We have many examples of these surviving, and they would be set up at crossroads, typically uh, at crossroads or at the foot of bridges, as we'll see in a second, um, and people would gather and uh, see these. It's through this process that the sort of uh, parodies or pastiche, mitate, that we see of these two places in the show. Uh, become possible. By the end of the 18th century, these women have made these places known to all kinds of people, everybody in Japan, so that, uh, we under, that, so that people can understand the joke uh, when they see the blue-skinned, uh, yellow-robed Datsueba, or they see um, uh, uh, people fighting and actors portraying the children on Sai no Kawara. They're able to understand these things because they know about them from these itinerant um, preaching nuns. Uh, here, uh, that last image was from the Freer Gallery. Uh, this image is, uh, I'm sorry, that last image was from the Burke Collection, now in the Met. This image is from the Freer Gallery, um, Rakuchu Rakugaizu, Scenes of Kyoto. And this is a detail. And a scene of Kyoto here at the foot of a bridge, people gathered and listening. Uh, Kumano Bikuni here with a stick pointing at this um, image with a, a sun and a moon a bridge with the ages of people um, and other items. To zoom in here for a second, here's what she's pointing at. This is a quite a schematic version of, the, of this sort of image that I'll be talking about in a minute. Uh, but it hits some of the main uh, 
famous scenes. Uh, here we have Jizo at the Saino Kawara protecting these children. Um, we have Mulian or Modgal Yayana, uh, the, the, the first explorer of hell, if you will, saving his mother, uh, who's here depicted as a hell being, having been snatched from a cauldron. Um, uh, uh, Datsueba here is here somewhere too. I'm not seeing her at this second. Uh, here is oh here here uh, here is the 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 the, the blood pool hell uh, and so on. So what I would really like to emphasize here, and this is something that's been mentioned uh, in the keynote speech, but also uh, uh, throughout the day from the first from the first talk forward, is the idea of a possible sublimation of hell. The idea that that, that hell is not really a place but is rather a state of mind or a succession of states of mind. So what we see here in the center of this uh, mandala, as it's called, is the character for heart or mind. And we see the nun pointing to this, this character, heart, mind. Um, one tantalizing thing, I was going to call it unf unfortunate, but let me call it tantalizing, is that we don't have the scripts that these women used when they, pr when they spoke and they preached on these mandalas. So we don't have the libretti. We have to imagine what, we, what they said. One thing that we can assume is that they must have talked about these are the tortures of hell, and we also know that experience this worldly or other wild worldly is mind created and that the mind is the key thing. There's a, uh, I talked about Jizo before. There's a very famous uh, Jizo story or Dizong story from China about Mr. Wang. Uh, Jizo, uh, Mr. Wang meets Jizo, Dizong, and he's told by Dizong, Jizo, if you fall into hell, recite this verse and you'll be okay. And the verse goes something like, um, uh, all of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, all of the realms are only creations of mind. Right? And this is the salvific verse, is to realize that uh, it's, it's in the mind. Uh, so this is the message that the Kumano Bikuni spread. They also spread, um, obviously, this message of uh, sort of dire consequences of bad behavior and so on and so forth. So this is the kind of image they carried, a large a large format uh, preaching mandala. And what I'd like to suggest is there's a couple of prominent, very prominent places in this preaching mandala that became well known to people through the preaching of Kumano Bikuni, uh, but became known in earlier periods, especially during the 17th century, uh, through books and uh, other media. So I'll, I'll talk about that now. Um, The Kumano Kanjin Jikai Mandala means the, uh, the, kan, the, the Kumano uh, Mandala uh, for visualizing the ten worlds in the mind. So we have the, the mind here. Uh, we have the ten worlds of Bo Bo Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Pratyeka Buddhas, and the six realms. Um, and we have here an offerings table. Uh, for a ceremony for hungry ghosts. So there's a lot of familiar things here from the, from the day to day. Um, there's also familiar figures. Uh, King Yama here, or Emma, Yen Lo Wang, who's sitting in front of his uh, karma mirror that like a, a video re re uh, reveals all the sins of one's life. One thing you'll notice here is that King Yama himself, presumably the most important person in hell, is quite a bit smaller, really, than either Datsueba here down in the corner or uh, this world of Saino Kawara, the children's limbo here. Uh, what I'd like to suggest at these places, uh, the children's limbo and Datsueba, uh, as well as other places, the, 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 the blood pool and hell and, uh, and so on, become more and more important in these early modern depictions of uh, the hell world. Uh, and again, uh, I am not going to go into this right now, but, but maybe uh, we'll talk to me about it later sometime. Um, there's, a ways, there's a lot of ways in which the increasing uh, uh, narrowness of the, the uh, patriarchal nature and Confucian ideology of the family uh, inform this uh, image and the cult around it in important ways. Um, now, I would like to talk briefly about two illustrated books in the New York Public Library uh, in the Spencer Collection. This is a book, uh, a printed book, uh, that is called uh, Fuji no Hito Anazoshi, uh, the, 
the tale of the Fuji cave or the Fuji person hole. So we heard about the hell gate before, right? So there is a, I've been in it, there's a gate, there's a, there's a, there's a deep cave at Mount Fuji that's very dark when you walk into it. I didn't get all the way down, uh, but I, I did walk into the, to the, to, to the first few hundred yards of it. Um, this idea, this book uh, promotes the idea that uh, hell exists in Japan inside of Mount Fuji. And when you go inside Mount Fuji, you can see uh, all of the features of hell. So this is a, a book that's a hell tour that, that is a kind of a, of a story that becomes popular at the end of the 16th century, uh, really takes off in the 17th century. Uh, we, we get printing coming along this book. Like I, I think I said, the, the, the blocks from it are, are from uh, 1627, but uh, it, uh, it, uh, this is a later reprinting. Um, and what we see here is the Saino Kawara. Uh, these children building the small stupas um, uh, uh, in, 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 in fear, in tears, uh, having a good time, some of them. We don't have Jizo here. We have different uh, hell, hell, uh, hell tour leaders, um, but I won't go into why right now. And here we have Datsu Eba from the same printed book. Um, one, a couple things I'd like to point out about her is her uh, way she's seated cross-legged and very prim and proper um, with a small mouth and a kind of a serious uh, expression. Um, a scholar named uh, Saka, uh, Chihiro Saka has written a, a wonderful monograph on Datsueba uh, that was just published last summer. And one of the things that she points out is the, the, the way that Datsueba in later depictions takes on a very demonic uh, appearance and how, the ways in which this is influenced by uh, earlier paintings of, of hell dwellers. This is another 17th century book in the Spencer Collection at the New York Public Library. It's a Nada Ehon, a, uh, a handwritten, uh, illustrated book in three volumes, beautiful book. Uh, and these books would be bought as uh, tourist items and then shared in small groups. Again, we've, we've talked a little bit or thought a little bit about reception. Um, in this case, we see Saino Kawara and Datsu Eba here com combined onto one, uh, uh, one opening here, or one hiraki in Japanese. And uh, this is quite a bit different than either the printed book or, or some other uh, uh, later illustrated books uh, that separate these two scenes into two parts of the book. Here we see them because uh, there is some text between when we, when we think about the story, uh, which this story first appears, uh, the oldest manuscript that we have currently is from 1602, uh, and it's the first place that this Saino Kawara is mentioned. So this place, Saino Kawara, is brand new, more or less, at the end of the, six, at the, end of the 16th, beginning of the 17th century. Um, again, Saino Kawara and uh, Datsueba. Again, this Datsueba uh, also uh, with a, uh, a gentle, uh, expression, uh, crossed legs, uh, her uh, body covered up. Uh, later we'll see that she's quite disheveled um, and uh, in various states of nakedness. I want to point out here in the Kanjin Jikaizu again the relative uh, importance of these two scenes of Saino Kawara and uh, Datsueba compared to other things. Here we see Jizo leading sinners out of hell, and there's many, many, too many things to describe here, but I, I just want to point out that these two scenes become quite important, even though uh, unbeknownst to the people seeing these images, they're only 100 years, 150 years old. These, these uh, Kanjin Jukaizu, the ones that we have, are primarily have uh, dates or the earliest ones, I should say, uh, have dates that put them in the mid, or, or dates from the middle of the uh, 18th century. But most of these dates are dates that were repairs were done. So that would mean they, would, uh, they had already been in use for several decades, if not 100 years. Uh, here we see a more demonic vision of, of Datsueba uh, with big eyes, uh, a bare chest, uh, holding these clothes with her leg uh, vertical. Um, Barbara Roosh, who's someone who's done a great deal of work on the Kumano Bikuni, has suggested that um, the Kumano, Kumano Bikuni were uh, uh, very well known for sitting, sitting in that particular um, posture for preaching. And we can see a kind of a, 
a feedback loop, if you will, between Datsueba and the Kumano Bikuni. Uh, one thing I'd just like to point out here in passing is that in many, many pictures of the uh, Sino Kawara, we have these children building these Godin Toe or five chakra stupas. We also often have a drumming figure with this kind of an hourglass drum that we just saw in Laurel Kendall's uh, presentation. This idea, uh, well, there's different kinds of interpretations, and like I said before, uh, we don't know exactly what these nuns said. Um, here we have a, an image that's not a, a, a jukaizu, it's a, a, a heaven and hell scroll. And uh, this is a detail, but what I will say that this is really the whole, almost the whole bottom half of the image of he heaven and hell uh, is taken up by uh, these two scenes. Uh, Datsueba, who is very famous as the, the figure at the gateway, the, f the figure at the limen, at the kind of... Uh, uh, ent the, the river or Sanzanokawa that's the entrance to the underworld. So she's very famous in separating uh, the, the space of the living from the space of the dead. Um, uh, Saka Chihiro, who I mentioned before, has pointed out that also in pilgrimage mandalas, um, the, the halls that were built to this figure, uh, Ubason or, or Datsueba, uh, that were often uh, sites of women's cults, uh, acted as uh, boundaries uh, within the, the, the sacred space of the, the shrine uh, or temple. Uh, here again, we, we, I just want to say that, that children can have fun here on Sino Kawara. It's not, it, there's, some, there's a lot of tears and there's a lot of frustration trying to build these stupas, but we also see uh, toys and sort of uh, exuberance and the rest. Um, again, these are, these are some later images, but uh, we see here uh, that this, this, is an Im this is about one third of a larger image, and that Sino Kawara and uh, Datsueba are depicted uh, very large here. Uh, here's, here's Emma's uh, karma mirror and so on. Uh, but we can imagine that in the preaching of the Kumano Bikuni, these places were quite uh, heavily emphasized. Um, here we see a particularly kind of a, a more modern, or uh, more, more recent, I should say, uh, Datsueba uh, or, or Kanjin Jukaizu screen uh, with a particularly ter terrifying Datsueba here. Uh, and then here again, we have uh, the Sino Kawara. Um, tug of war is a common kind of uh, theme on Sino Kawara, increasingly into the, the later early modern period. Um, what I want to point out here that in, in this particular Representation, and again, this is about a, a, a third or a quarter of the whole of the whole image. Um, where this offerings table, that's the main ritual that that this uh, banner uh, is related to or based on, which which was very much influenced by the importation of sweet nectar paintings or gammo uh, from uh, Korea. Uh, this offerings table for hungry ghosts has become really quite small in comparison to uh, the children's limbo or to um, this world of, uh, of, of Datsueba. And uh, uh, in, the, in the images we were looking at before, there's the, there's the character heart or mind here. So um, in conclusion, I, I think what I want to say is that uh, this process of uh, performance is the way in which uh, the features of hell and knowledge about hell and understanding of hell, familiarity of hell, uh, was disseminated throughout Japan. By the end of the uh, 18th century, uh, 19th cent into the 19th century, so that by the time uh, we get to the period of the uki ukiyo-e prints that uh, perform pastiche or parody, uh, of these particular uh, elements, whether it's Sino Kawara or Datsu Eba, were well established enough uh, that, that a uh, kind of a casual joke uh, could be made of them uh, without um, excessive uh, explanation. That's all of my comments today. Thank you guys very much. And one thing I would like to ask, I'd like to start with this incredible panel, uh, but then I would like to particularly engage some of the the presenters throughout the day, things that have um, arisen for them and, and connections or, or disavowals, whatever, um, just because it's, it's um, always 
the, the most interesting thing, as you were saying, to make those connections and realize uh, some, of the, some of the other links that, that exist. And um, I, you know, thinking about performance, that's what animates, I think, so much of, of the work that we're seeing. Whether you're, you know, the animation that you're talking about with the, the women uh, who are talking about the, the images, but bringing them to life in a particular way, um, the intercession that that the the Mudang and the motion is doing in terms of the, the living and dead, and then of course, it, with Wayan Kulit and thinking about how that operates, and one of the things that really struck me was the difference in an individual looking at an image or, or, or feeling that they are responsible and the, the community shared experience of, of, uh, that, that is so often uh, a major part of performance, at least the way we're defining it now. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on those differences and, and things that have uh, you know, kind of come up for you in, in the day in terms of thinking about the performance versus some of the, the earlier conversations, um, whether that is on image text or, or even uh, philosophical doctrine. Laurel? OK, this will be a quickie. Um, but one of the things that strikes me is uh, well, there, there are the polarities of pure text and pure performance. And we've seen a lot of gradations in between. We've also seen some work of reconstruction. I mean, I could feel your pain. We don't know what text the nuns used. It's, it's the guesswork that keeps creative scholars going. And how different that is from living traditions that we have access to, where the text is fairly not present. I mean, Padi Kongju, to the degree that the story of this woman's journey exists as text, it's the folklorist texts. And maybe we are to a point where we begin to consider those things as manifestations, witnesses in their own right, not just you know, 10 steps back, but in Korea they become a part of what goes back to a living tradition. Matthew? Yeah, this, I mean, this is an interesting dynamic, which has come up repeatedly in court versus non-court representations, texts which are for people in the know, the Sufi elites uh, versus the general population. I think that performance is a leveler, uh, and that in a public performance, whether that's a good, which takes place not only in a family, but in a community, or whether that's the preaching nuns at the crossroads, or a Wai and Kulit performance in a village in Java or Bali, there needs to be an offer for everyone, right? There has to be enough sides of a performance or aspects of a performance that a child can appreciate it. Um, and I've, we've seen children who are coming to this exhibit um, I, I heard one adult telling the child, those, those images are very scary, they're not for you, and the child is protesting, but I really like them. <laughs> right? So the, the, that, that's part of the dynamic, right? is that there are aspects which different people can key into. Uh, and I think that's what makes hell interesting as a subject, in part, because there's this whole theological aspect of it, but there's also the spectacle of it, which has come up a lot, and the humor, uh, and, and many other things as well. Yeah, and I, I think what you're saying about the idea of uh, there being a gathering of different kinds of people there uh, is really important. And uh, one of the things that the, it was in the keynote uh, to begin with, but then this morning, um, Sonam repeated it in a, in a very uh, kind of arresting way that I, I, is not coming to me right now. He's, I think he said it's not just moderns that are interested in this. And I remember our kind of initial 
conversation, and I said, well, there is this image of the heart-mind character, and this is something that's really appealing to moderns, right? Because we want to say, oh, it's not real, it's not hell. And uh, hearing that this morning again really did, did uh, kind of catch me and make me say, well, it's not just us. It's a variety of people, and it's, it's a kind of a built-in um, sublimation, if you will, uh, uh, of the idea of hell that's accessible to some people, not as accessible to others, but apparently was part of the preaching. I mean, that's what we can imagine, right, is that, 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 that the preaching may have varied, uh, obviously, from none to none, but also, uh, depending on the person uh, hearing the message, uh, it could be taken quite differently. Yeah. Getting back to Matthew's point about the kids saying, yeah, it's scary and I really want to see it, um, something about hell, and we raised this a little bit uh, earlier, that's thrilling, that's a free song, that lends itself to the performances and the paintings and the texts, but it's got to be made vivid. Mm. Uh, but it's, it's good to think with in a scary, morbid way. You know, it's been an interesting um journey for us here because we sometimes overthink things. And having this exhibition, so, and we've just come through COVID and, and a, a time that feels so fraught, so we're very serious. And so many people that I've, I've met, you know, who are coming, young people in particular, who are just sort of excited. And, and I've told my colleagues, I, you know, I like hang out on the weekends and I said, well, so what'd you think? And the, this one couple came in, they were very tattooed, and they said, oh, this is just for us. This is grotesque <laughs> and macabre, I love it. And I was like, right, okay. <laughs> that was not exactly what I had expected, which was good. I thought that was good. One of the, the other aspects that I think about in performance in particular, and I don't know as much of the, the time you're talking about, but I'm guessing, is, is its intersection with the contemporary. It's certainly mm -hmm. true in wine, it's certainly true in, in the cut, that, that people find ways to reference what's going on right now, mm -hmm. to make it absolutely current. And, and I feel like that's so much a part of what we've been talking about today too, is, you look at these images and there's some way that you can really resonate whether they were made, whether it's the, the video mm -hmm. art or, or it's something from the 14th century. So I just wondered if you could comment on the, that idea of, of currency of the moment and, and that aspect. And then I'd like to open it up to all of you. Well, as far as the images I was showing, it's a little bit of a a dead tradition is really not the way I want to put it. Uh, it's, a, it's a tradition that's a kind of a museum piece and is curated, right? So there are reconstructions of what they might have said, and there are kind of shows of this, but this is not a kind of a living form of tours of hell. Um, another thing that I didn't mention uh, that is also not performed now are puppet shows of hell. That was a very common way of talking about hell and demonstrating hell of uh, you know, it's easy enough to torture, torture puppets in real time. Uh, um, so anyway, puppet, puppet theater in this. But, but as far as uh, modern versions of this, this is not something that it, it, uh, exists in Japan. And, and you do mention the, the video installation. And I was, that, that to me was one of my favorite pieces in the show, really, the Lu Yang, to see, to see the way what she did with that. Speaking of puppets, um, and these are pieces that you missed for the show, in the collection of the American Museum of Natural History from a hundred, more than 100 years ago, 120 years ago collected from China, lovely little shadow puppets of bodies being sawed and people being ground in mortar. So more hell. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, the, again, this, this, is, this was entertainment. People paid money to go and see bodies being sawed and so on. I mean, this isn't how I think of, you know, hell sermons in the context of my Catholic childhood. This is fun stuff. Um, in terms of adaptability, um, I got to that at the end of my talk, talking about how the ritual for the dead, how emotionally resonant it is, and how symbolically compelling it is, how translatable it is, that we saw um, 
the shaman Kim Gum Hwa doing a ritual for the dead after 9-11 at Lincoln Center in Korean. And everybody knew what was going on and people were crying. Um, we saw the Chindo Shikim Kut translated to the stage, this very stage, and it worked. There's, you know, there's just, sometimes, you know, it, it just hits, it just hits right. So performance always happens in different moments simultaneously, right? It unfolds in the present, uh, and in order to communicate with an audience, it has to speak that audience's language. But it also resuscitates and brings new valences to things from the past. Um, so in Balinese Wayang, the gods and the heroes are speaking in Kawi, the language, the ecclesi ecclesiastical Sanskritic language, and the clowns are interpreting uh, into contemporary Balinese. Um, the images of hell are referencing, uh, this was brought out earlier, punishments which actually existed in the past. That there once was a time when people were tortured in, in spe specifically the ways we're, we're seeing depicted. And, um, but it also, you know, the, the performance also anticipates futures, right? And it deals, specifically these performances of hell, deal with anxieties about the future. Where am I going to end up? Where are my ancestors now, right? Um, how do we get them moving to a better place, right? This is, this is a future-oriented form, right? So these three different moments, past, present, future, are simultaneous with each other. And the efficacy of these enactments depends precisely on this three moments happening at the same time. And there's a certain permission to be transgressive, isn't there? Right. That, that's like, that's so outrageous. I can't believe they did that or that or that. You know, and that's, that is a part of, it's not only performance, it's certainly in the images that we see upstairs. And this is Bruce Kapfer's wonderful book, A Celebration of Demons, right? Where he says that the demons afflicting society are summoned in these Sinhalese exorcistic rituals, right? And are, are mocked and are yeah. made fun of and thereby deflating, right? Your therapeutic aspect, deflating the demons which otherwise we hold in such high regard, right? So the, that comedy is in, really important for the ritual aspect. Yes, levity is very important, absolutely. Um, let's open it up. Adriana. Me again. Um, I just wanted to point out that um, just in terms of the example of a puppet in the exhibition or some images of actors and so on, and I really didn't get to, I didn't, explore this as much, or very much, but I wanted to kind of hint at it. This morning we were talking a lot about, you know, actual texts and images. What are the artists depicting? The imagination of the artist, you know, what's in the text? What isn't, you know, what isn't in the text? What's in the artist's imagination? And I think it's really important to think about how does performance fit in as well, you know? how were the, what, what were the artists seeing? What were those populations that they, or the cultures um, in those periods of time when they were living, what were they being exposed to in the way of, you know, theater, be it puppetry or even uh, a sort of um, performance ritual um, in, in the temples and so on? How, how much is what we're looking at actually a reflection of of that reality as well. Yeah, I think that's an important part. And even, I mean, you know, the historical context of each of these, and then we were talking earlier about the idea that objects change in their meaning. Um, I'm just thinking of Arjun Apadurai's book about, about that. And so we bring the changed context to, to an exhibition, but also to a, a performance, mm -hmm. or imagining what that performance was. And I don't know if you meant that there are people in Japan who are reimagining this. Exactly. Right. I'd be curious to hear about that. I don't. I, I, let me see if I can call on some help here, uh, Max. What can you say about modern performance of the Jukai uh, Mandara? Yeah, I can't say anything. Um, <laughs> but there, uh, 
There was there was uh, there was one uh, what last month uh, is uh, oh there you go Mia is still here did you see that the when they had the uh, woman doing the etoki on the and I don't know if it was on a on a jikai mandara or whether it was on a nachi sanke uh, that was uh, part of a, of a kumano event that, sorry to put you on the spot there. Uh, but it was something that I wanted to go to, but I was out of town for. Um, so I didn't actually see the performance. But I know that it's done. Um, I think that it's done at uh, it's done at the Kumano shrines, and they have actually sort of recreated a slightly modernized version um, of the mandala. And then they have someone who who performs a a modern etoki on it. I don't know the degree to which that's sort of just a sort of tourist theater or, you know, whether, uh, you know, in an attempt to sort of provide a, some sort of living historical context, you know, however, however the performative, um, or whether it's something that allows for, you know, a new, new sets of issues I mean, it's it's almost impossible to even perform something, you know, historical without making contemporary references. I mean, no 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 production of Shakespeare, right, is ever without uh, contemporary uh, references or resonance. Uh, so that's an I don't know the answer to that, but it's. it's I think it's, one thing we can say is they are not religious performances. <laughs> they are not. They don't. They're not imbued with a sense of the numinous or the, the sacred or the, the, the terrifying, that kind of thing. Well, even the, the, what you just saw from Keeney Pavilion, I mean, what her comments were was she studied this form and she was just supposed to replicate it exactly this way. And then, and then coming here, she was encouraged to, to interpret that. And, and for her, that meant, oh, there's something beyond just replicating. I can. I'm, I have permission to explore that. So that's, that's an interesting component, I think, of, of, of any performed piece because performance is live and it's always, it, you know, it's always a little different. I, I always won't. a little different. But even by, by virtue of who's in the room, even, even a, and I don't know, I'd be curious to hear, but even a sermon that is, that, that has been said for the same sermon has been done for a hundred years, but the people in the room may be different. So I'd be curious to hear commentary on that. Well, I was curious about the this kind of question of performance and different performances. What's a real piece and what's a set piece and what's appropriative or things like that? Because you mentioned, Laurel, you mentioned the uh, political protests, right? And the political use of good and of shamans. And I wondered if there's something you can say about the attitude of people within the Manchin community or Manchin themselves towards, let's say, actors who pose as, mm -hmm. as shamans or political uh, activists who use the, the modes of shamanism in their protests. It's, they've been surprisingly welcoming, actually. Um, I mean, I would not say that that performance that I showed from the press, she wasn't a shaman, but in that moment, which was a very passionate moment in South Korea, I can't say that performance was devoid of, of religious feeling. People really got into it. They were really encountering and trying to help the soul of one of their comrades, and in that process, move the struggle for democracy down the road. And there's a um, Korean scholar, Kim gwang Ok, who has written about that particular encounter and really talks about it as consequential, that this was part of the emotionality that led to that critical moment when the Chun Doo-hwan regime just had to stop. And this is something I learned from actually doing ritual performances in Java, uh, creating holy water, blessing rice fields, expelling spirits, all of this. It doesn't matter that who I am, actually. Um, it, what matters is the belief of the community. And if you get the words right and the form is correct, it's the, it becomes religious, not because of virtue of the, the central actor, right? But because the community is able to participate. 
they're able to bring the implements to the, to the stage, which need to be included. They're able to take them out to their fishing, uh, their, their boats, their rice fields, right? That, that's what makes it religious. It's not, it's not what happens on stage, right? So one last question. Um, is it religious or is it sacred? Mm. So, so when I think about, about performance in, a, in, in either Bali or Java, there are, there are instances that would be considered you know, sacred meaning or, or religious in that they're a required part of a ritual. You know what I mean? Like, like mm. if you talk about, in, um, oh, what's it called? The, the wayang that's done in the inner temple. that Wayanglama. Wayanglama. So that's different than, than a wayang that's done in the, in the outer temple, even though it's still part of, of welcoming whatever divinity is present at that moment. Right. Well, I mean, these are tricky words, right? Anyway, yeah. Religion depends on one person's religion is another person's desecration of a religion, right? Um, religion has its institutional kind of associations. Um, I was using it in more and an anthropological associations. Yeah. There are people who will argue it's it's so embedded in Western understandings of what religion is, and maybe we'd be better off avoiding it wherever we can. Yeah, and sacred is a value judgment, right? And so somebody yeah. say this is very sacred. Yeah. Other person say no, 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 that's a tourist object, right? <laughs> here, here, case in point, uh, I don't know right, about that. right, right here, right. You don't step over a gamelan, do you? Sardono did when he performed at BAM. <laughs> right. <laughs> Obviously, we need another symposium. But I think that's not going to be. I just want to thank you and everyone who's here. Um, it's really been an incredible day and there's so much to take in.